Today, we are going to talk about random variables, more specifically, what they are and what they do. We're also going to discuss the types of random variables. So the basic definition and function of a random variable is that the random variable maps outcomes of a random process in the sample space to a numerical quantity. So what we mean by this is, say we have a random variable x representing some random process, and I don't want you to completely, I don't want you to worry about understanding what I'm saying here completely because I'm illustrating what this definition is saying here. We'll talk more about this later to better your understanding. But as I was saying, say we have a random variable representing a random process. What this definition is saying is that this random variable x representing some random process maps the random process in the sample space to a numerical quantity. So this here is the numerical quantity. Let me show you this again using a more detailed representation. Say we have a random variable y. And see here is another thing. The random variable can be y or x or z or w or whatever you want it to be. That doesn't matter as long as you're consistent. So say you have a random variable y representing the random process of tossing a coin. Then what this definition says is this random variable y representing tossing a coin maps the random process of tossing a coin to a numerical quantity. So let's say in this case, the numerical quantity is one half. So again, I don't expect you to understand this entirely, but this is just a basic illustration of what this definition is saying here. Random variables at first sound a little bit confusing because immediately we relate them to the more common and well-known variables from algebra class. However, these two concepts are not the same. Random variables are not the same as, tra as the traditional variables we use in regular mathematics. They are different. This begs the question, what exactly is the difference between random variables and traditional variables? or algebraic variables as we called them in high school. Well, to begin with, they are visually different. Visually, a random variable is denoted by a capital letter, whereas a traditional variable is in lowercase. More deeply, a traditional variable typically represents a single value or a function. Even when it represents a function, we know that there is a value to be found. The variable has a solution. In other words, where variables are used as functions, we can solve the algebraic problem by finding a particular value or perhaps several values. But random variables are different. A random variable takes values with different probabilities. It makes no sense to talk about a random variable without probabilities. Typically, when discussing random variables, we would say things like the probability that a random variable is equal to something, or that it is less than or greater to something is. Let's familiarize ourselves with the mathematical notations that are used when working with random variables. This is something that students are confused about, so it's good to cl clarify. The notation that is used in association to random variables is P bracket big X is equal to small x. This refers to the probability that the random variable, denoted by the capital X, is equal to a particular value, which is denoted by the lowercase x. Another notation looks like this. P, bracket, small a, is less than big X, is less than small b. This basically states that the probability that the random vari variable X takes, takes lies in between the values a and b. There are two types of random variables. They are the discrete random variables and the continuous random variables. And I'm going to introduce these to you guys a little bit right now. So let's start with discrete random variables. Discrete random variables can take on a countable number of possible values. For example, when rolling a die, the possible values we can get are 1, 2, 3, 4, five, and six. There are six possible values. This is a countable amount. Note that the, the possible values do not have to be integers or counts. They can be, for example, values like 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3, 1 1.4, 1 1.5, 1 1.6, 1 1.7, 1 1.8, 1 1.9, 1 1.10, 1 1.11, 1 1.12, 1 1.13, 1
1.3, and so forth. The key point here is that these possible values are countable. 1.1, 1.2, and 1.3 are three numbers. We have three values here. So the possible amount of values in this case is 3, which is a countable amount. Therefore, it is discrete. Notice, the list of possible values can be an infinite list. The random variable is still discrete as long as the possible values in the list can still be counted. For example, the number of lottery tickets purchased until the first winning ticket is a discrete random variable. We might get a winning ticket at the first time, or we might need to wait until the second time, or the third time, or the fourth time, and so on. We don't know when we will get it, so the possible value goes to infinity. However, we can still count these values, so the first time, the second time, the third time, etc. It's countable, so it is a discrete random variable. Continuous random variables, on the other hand, take on an uncountable number of possible values. And what I mean by this is, a continuous random variable is a random variable that can take on an infinite amount of values, infinitely many values. For example, consider a random variable taking on any number in the interval 1, 2. The possibilities here are endless. It could take 1.1, or 1.1111, or 1.2, or 1.1211, and so forth. There are an infinite amount of values that the random variable can take. A more worldly ex example would be the amount of time it may take to do something, as the possibilities of that are also endless. It is uncountable, so it is continuous. A probability distribution for a random variable x is a listing of all possible values of x and their probabilities of occurring. The simple way to think of a probability distribution is the way to represent how probabilities of different outcomes are distributed. It is important to note that for this video, we will focus only on discrete random variables. Remember that a discrete random variable are random variables that can take on a countable number of possible values and which are usually denoted as P of big X is equal to small x, which basically says the probability that the random variable, which is denoted by the big X, is equal to a particular value which is denoted by the lowercase x. Now we will talk about probability mass function, or PMF for short. PMF is a function, or sometimes a table or a list, that gives the probability that a discrete random variable is exactly equal to some value. Sometimes it is presented as a table or a list. Or a list. So when we work with PMFs, there are two very important properties that we should keep in mind. We will talk about those properties right now. So suppose P of X is the probability mass function of a random variable X. Then P of X must satisfy the following conditions. First, the probability of X should be greater than or equal to zero. And second, the sum of all the probabilities of X should be equal to one. Here is another important concept of random variables called the cumulative distribution function, or CDF, of a random variable. The CDF of a random variable x, which is usually denoted as f subscript big X of small x. So this here is the notation of the CDF. Let's not get, conf get it confused with um, anything else. This is what the notation of the CDF looks like. So the CDF is the, is the probability that the random variable x will take a value less than or equal to x. Let me first explain this notation to you properly. This notation basically says that big F, um, which is the CDF of the random variable, so that's in the subscript big X, and over here the small x just represents or just means that this CDF is a function in terms of small x. So basically, what this definition is saying is the big F of subscript big X, so that is the CDF of a random variable X, which is in terms of small x, is equal to the probability um, that big X is less than or equal to small x for all x belonging to real numbers. These functions are used to calculate accumulated, accu accumulated probability.
And this will make more sense to you in just a bit when we do an example. Today, we're going to talk about the expectation and variance of discrete random variables. So let's begin off by talking about expected value. The expected value of a discrete random variable is the theoretical mean of the discrete random variable. It is calculated by summing the product of all the possible values that a random variable can take and their corresponding probabilities. So for example, the expectation of a random variable x can be written as follows. So over here we have the expectation of x is equal to the sum of all the possible x values that the random variable can take multiplied by their corresponding probabilities. So that is all the possible values x that the random variable can take multiplied by their corresponding probabilities. It is also important to note that the expectation of x is often denoted by a mu. So that means, so mu then represents the expectation of x, which basically represents the mean. Now, how do we find the expectation of g of x? Well, we know the equation for finding expected value is as follows. So the expected value of g of x is equal to the sum of g of x for all the x values that g of x can take multiplied by their corresponding probabilities. So again, we just plug and chug. We're going to use the same distribution as before to do this. So in our example, since g of x is equal to x squared, the expectation of x squared is going to be the sum of all the x squared for the x's, for all the x's in the distribution multiplied by their corresponding probabilities. So that is the sum of x squared for all the x's in our distribution multiplied by their corresponding probabilities. So that's going to give us, well, we're going to start off with zero. So we're going to have zero squared multiplied by its corresponding probability, which is 0 0.15, plus 1 squared, multiplied by its corresponding probability, which is 0 0.6, plus 2 squared, multiplied by its corresponding probability, which is 0 0.25. When we calculate this, we get 1.6. So the expectation of x squared in this case is going to be 1.6. Another important quantity for us is the variance of a random variable. The variance, represented, which is represented by sigma squared, is the expectation of the squared deviation of a random variable from its mean. It represents the uncertainty of the event. So to better understand what this definition says, let's take a look at it in the mathematical notation. So what we have here is the, expected, is the expectation, so over here the expectation, of the random variable x, which is over here, minus the mean, which is over here, squared. We squared this entire thing. So we have, again, the random variable x minus mean whole squared, and we take the expectation of that. So again, the main idea behind variance is you take the values of your data points, subtract the means from them, and square them. Your variance is the expected value of the point. Note that we can think of x minus mu squared as g of x and use the previous formula. So from the previous formula, we know that the expectation of x minus mu squared is equal to the expectation of g of x, which we think of x minus mu whole squared as. This is going to be equal to the summation of all the x's that g of x can take multiplied by its corresponding probabilities. So what this will give us is the sum of x minus mu whole squared for all the possible x's that this, random, that this distribution can take and we're going to multiply it by, its, by the corresponding probabilities of those x's. And when we do this, what we get is a proper formula for variance of x. Then we see that the variance of x, which is equal to the, which is equal to the expectation of x minus mu whole squared, is equal to the summation of x minus mu whole squared for all the x's that the distribution can take, multiplied by its corresponding probabilities. So to calculate variance, we need to find the difference between every possible x and the expectation, then square the distance times the probability that x occurs, and sum up all over the x's. Here I'm going to show you an alternate and sometimes more convenient way for calculating the variance of x. So the variance of x can be shown as the expectation of x squared minus the expectation of x whole squared. So this can also be written as the expectation of x squared minus mu squared. Note here that the expectation of x squared does not equal to mu squared. So when do we want to use this formula? 
Well, it is useful when x minus mu or x minus mu squared need a lot of calculations. Also, often mean is already calculated before variance. So to calculate variance, all we need is to find expectation of x squared. Remember how to find expectation of x squared? Just use the formula. Expectation of x squared is just the sum of x squared for all the possible x's that the distribution can take multiplied by its corresponding probabilities. Since the variance has a square in its formula, so you know, it's written as sigma squared, the variance does not go on the same scale as the random variable x. So we introduce the standard deviation instead. So what the standard deviation is, it's sigma equal to the square root of variance of x. So the standard deviation of x is on the same scale as the random variable x. Here are some more handy properties that might be useful when calculating the expectation and variance of random variables. So the first property we're going to look at is, for a random variable x and real numbers a and b, the expectation of ax plus b is equal to a times the expectation of x plus b. And we're going to show you how this works using the properties that we already know about expectation of x. So what we know is the expectation of ax plus b is equal to the summation of ax plus b for all x multiplied by its corresponding probabilities. So here what we can do now is we can multiply the probability of x into the, into the, um, into the sum of ax plus b over here. So that's for all x is we're going to have ax times probability of x plus b times the probability of x. This, because summation is linear, this is just going to be equal to ax times the probability of x for all x plus the summation of b times the probability of x for all x. And now we can just multiply the a out. So we could just have summation of x times the probability of x for all x plus b times the summation of the probability of x for all x. So what do we see here? Notice over here that we already said from before that the summation of x times the probability of x for all x is just the same as the expectation of x. And the summation of all the probabilities should be equal to 1. So what this gives us is a times the expectation of x plus b, just as we wanted, just as we claimed. Another property we're going to look at is to do with variances. So what the property says is, the, for a random variable x and real numbers a and b, the variance of ax plus b is equal to a squared times the variance of x. And we're going to show you this using everything we know about variances. So, no, so we know that the variance of ax plus b is equal to the expectation of ax plus b squared minus the expectation of ax plus b whole squared. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to expand out everything that we have here. So we're going to have expectation of a squared x squared plus 2abx plus b squared minus the expect minus a times the expectation of x plus b whole squared. So how did we get this term here? Well, we used the rule that we know, which is expectation of ax plus b is equal to a times the expectation of x plus b. We learned this earlier on. So we just rewrote this to look more like that because that will be more helpful for us. We're going to use this exact same property to simplify out this term. So this is going to give us a squared times the expectation of x squared plus 2ab times the expectation of x plus b squared minus, and we're going to now um, expa expand this term here. So that's going to give us a squared expectation of, expectation of x squared minus 2ab times the expectation of x minus b squared. Now all we have to do is we have to simplify. And when we do simplify, we get a squared times the expectation of x squared minus a squared times the expectation of x whole squared. We can, we can factor out the a squared, which will give us a, a squared times the expectation of x squared minus expectation of x whole squared. What do we know about this term here? This is the formula for variance of x. So what do we end up with? We end up with a squared times the variance of x just as we wanted. So this is true. 
Today we're going to talk about expectation invariance of more than one independent random variable. More specifically, we're going to talk about their properties. Now say there is a new random variable y that is identical to x. That is, the probability distribution of y is given as follows. So basically this is the same distribution as the one we had for x, except the variables are now different. Then in this case, the expectation and variance of y is the same as x. That is, the expectation of y is equal to 1.1 and the variance of y is equal to 0 0.39. We're going to assume that x and y are independent random variables. In this video, we will be talking about expectation of x plus y and variance of x plus y. Additionally, we will compare these expectation and variance with expectation of 2x and variance of 2x. Let's start with what we already have learned in order to help us find expectation of 2x and variance of 2x. So recall a handy equation for expectation that we learned in our previous video. That is expectation of ax plus b is equal to a times the expectation of x plus b. So then the expectation of 2x here is just going to be 2 times the expectation of x. So here a is equal to 2 and b is equal to 0. So from what we have done earlier, this means just means that the expectation of 2x is equal to 2 times 1.1, which is just equal to 2.2. And by applying the property of variance that we learned, we have that the variance of ax plus b is just equal to a squared times variance of x. So from this, we get that variance of 2x is just equal to 2 squared times variance of x. So here again, a is equal to, zero, a is equal to 2. So this is just equal to 4 times the variance of x, which is just going to be equal to 4 times 0 0.39, since that's what the variance is from earlier, which is just going to be equal to 1.56. Then how about expectation of x plus y and variance of x plus y? Let's introduce some interesting properties of expectation and variance of random variables. For any random variables, expectation of x plus y is equal to expectation of x plus expectation of y. So in our example, this expectation of x plus y would be equal to 1.1 because expectation of x is 1.1 plus again 1.1 because expectation of y is also 1.1. So this would equal to 2.2. Then because x and y are identical, expectation of x plus y is just equal to expectation of 2x. Then, if x and y are independent, variance of x plus y is equal to variance of x plus variance of y. So in our example, variance of x plus y is going to be equal to 0 0.39 because variance of x is 0 0.39 plus again 0 0.39 because the variance of y is also 0 0.39 and this is equal to 0 0.78. But notice here that even though x and y are identical, variance of x plus y does not equal to variance of 2x, which was again remember 1.56. Over here, variance of x plus y does not equal to variance of 2x because x and y are not independent. In order for this property to hold, x and y need to be independent. We will talk more about independence later on, but for, not, but for now, just remember that for this property to hold, x and y must be independent. In addition, remember that there are no such properties for standard deviation, no matter how many random variables are involved. In other words, we cannot directly calculate standard deviation of 2x or standard deviation of x plus y from standard deviation of x. What we can do, however, is transfer standard deviation of x into variance of x. We know that the standard deviation of x, which is sigma, is equal to the square root of variance of x. Then that means that the variance of x is equal to the standard deviation of x squared. Then we get the value of variance of 2x or variance of x plus y. Then finally, we can get the values of standard deviation of 2x or standard deviation of x plus y by taking the square root of the value we obtain. So in our example, the standard deviation of 2x is going to be equal to the square root of the variance of 2x, which we calculated as 
and this is going to give us 1.25. And the standard deviation of x plus y is going to be equal to the square root of the variance of x plus y, which we calculated as 0 0.78. And when we calculate this, we're going to get 0 0.88. They are not equal, which was expected since the variances were not equal. To wrap up, we can see a more generalized case for expectation and variance of more than one random variables. For n random variables x1, x2, all the way to xn, the expectation of x1 plus x2 all the way to xn is equal to expectation of x1 plus expectation of x2 all the way to expectation of xn. This is true whether x and y are independent or not. Now if x1, x2 all the way to xn are identical, that is x1 is equal to x2, which is equal to x3, which is equal to x4 all the way through to xn, then expectation of x1 plus x2 all the way to xn is equal to expectation of x1 plus expectation of x2 all the way to expectation of xn, which is just equal to n times the expectation of x1, or in other words, n times mu. And if x1, x2 all the way to xn are independent random variables, so that's important, remember these have to be independent random variables, then the variance of x1 plus x2 all the way to xn is equal to variance of x1 plus variance of x2, x2 all the way to variance of xn, which is just equal to n times the variance of x1, which is just equal to n times sigma squared. So remember, in order for this property to hold for variance, x and the random variables x have to be independent random variables.